to know that we're praying for you, uh, all of you here. Um, I come on Sunday, uh, Saturday nights and do some final sermon preps, and I walk through the aisles and just pray um, for every seat and every person who would occupy these seats. And, and those who are watching online, our prayers are for you too, and those in the parking lot, uh, that God would bless you, his hand be upon you, and be carrying you through these, these challenging, challenging seasons. And I think so often in this, this time, we, we focus in on everything that's going bad. And we, we watch, I hate watching the news these days. <laughs> um, we don't have cable TV, and so there's only like five channels. So it's either Daniel Tiger, which we get a lot of, or that's like Mr. Rogers in cartoon kind of, you know. And uh, it's either that or the news, basically. And so it's like, that's tough. I don't know which one to pick. Uh, and so... It's, it's uh, depressing to watch that over and over again. It's the same stories. And, but, but what if this? What if, what if this? What if instead of focusing in on them, them is the people out there who maybe we don't agree with or don't get along with or don't like what they're doing. What if instead of focusing on them, what if we focused on us? What if we focus on us? And, and even the, the worship today just encourages me. It's like, wow, God can do an amazing work in me and can do amazing things through me, through me, in me and through me. What if I just tuned out all the noise and allowed him to move? How cool would that be? So that's my encouragement for you guys today. And um, so know that we're praying for you, we're with you, and uh, we're going to get through this craziness and uh, God is coming back soon. And if you see injustice happening in the world, you see things going downhill, that's not a surprise to God. And a lot of this is because of sin. Because sin in this world has just wreaked havoc. But God is coming back to rescue us and make things right. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Welcome, kids. All the kids, I know since we don't have family ministries going on uh, like we typically do, welcome kids, glad you guys are here. If you have kids that get rowdy or, or, or crying or whatever, don't worry, I'm used to it. And if your kid's crying, I feel better about myself as a parent. And I also, seriously, I'm like, oh, it's not us this time, sweet! So that does not bother me, so... Don't worry about that. Welcome those sitting in overflow seating and cry room and all that. We understand. We understand your pain sometimes. So glad that you guys are here with us kids. And if you don't have a power pack, you can get one uh, in the, the hallway there. And in August, in August, we're having Promised Land and Fusion Takeover, which they're saying, Pastor Jeff, take a seat. We're going to share the story. And so I'm excited for that. I'm really excited for that. Promise and Fusion Sundays. And uh, we've done that way in the past, years ago, oh, probably 10 plus years ago, we, we've done that. And I'm excited to have them uh, share the Bible story with us and the worship and, and let the kids go crazy with us. So that'll be fun in August. Another thing I wanted to let you know is we'll be having a baptism in September. Okay, we, I, we're, the family ministries is planning it a little bit, um, trying to figure out when the exact date is of that, but we're going to have a baptism opportunity. And a baptism is an opportunity where we decide, where we make a decision to make a public profession of our faith. That's how we do it here at Crossroads. I know many of us, most of us have been raised, you know, Lutheran or Catholic or something like that. And so we have baptism as something that happens when you're a baby. Um, we, we go through what scripture teaches about baptism. Infant baptism is, is just something that we did in the, in the history of the church. It's a, it's a practice of the church. But in scripture, what would happen is, is people would come to faith in Jesus. Hey, yes, I believe, I believe in Jesus. And they receive him as Savior and Lord. And then they would say, where's the water? Because I want to be baptized. And, it, and, it, and it, it, it was a foreshadowing of what the Old Testament had in the Old Testament law with this cleanse, cleansing process. And, and it's a really cool opportunity that Jesus said, hey, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And so this baptism is really doing exactly what God is asking us to do. 
It's that public profession of faith. Yes, I am a follower of Christ and identifying as such. And so look for that in September. We'll talk to you more about baptism. We'll have a class on that that just, just looks at scripture and what scripture says and so you can understand what it's all about. So that's coming up. Another thing I want to mention just briefly, last thing, just real quick. Uh, Stacy mentioned the town hall meeting. So in our statement of faith, uh, we have a, a really solid statement of faith. There's one little term in there that's like a little controversial. And people who are solid theologically land on a couple different areas on this specific topic, in my opinion. And the word is premillennial, okay? That was in our statement of faith for years. When, when, we, when we redid our statement of faith or, or uh, updated it, uh, I don't know, like a decade ago, that was a debatable term, premillennial, the premillennial return of Christ, Christ will return. That's, a, that's something that our denomination has decided to remove from our statement of faith, premillennial, okay? Now, some people, they could care less about that. I mean, there are um, other, other uh, associations of churches, denominations of churches are removing a lot of things from their <laughs> statement of faith that's really sketchy. Um, this, in my opinion, is not something like that. But, if you have concerns about that or you want to just talk about that, we're bringing in Greg Strand. Stacy read his like resume of what he, all he does. This is, how, this is who he is, in my opinion, layman's terms. He is the head of the theology of our whole denomination, basically. So he is like the national theologian in our denomination. He's going to come here and engage us in this conversation, okay? Because... You know, I can try and explain it as best as possible, but he's like the expert, the guy. If you want to wrestle with him over it, that's what that's for. So Greg Strand, he'll be here August 9th, I believe. So don't miss that if you're interested in that. Okay, let's dive in. Unlikely heroes, unlikely heroes. God raising up some unlikely heroes called the judges in the book of Judges. These leaders who would help rescue the people of Israel. See, God told the people of Israel, if you obey, you will be blessed. But if you disobey, I will turn you over to your enemies and you will be cursed. Blessings if you obey, cursed if you walk away. And that's kind of the story, a lot of the story of the Old Testament. And as we get to the book of Judges, God's people, the Israelites, are taking steps to walk further and further away from God. Okay, the book of Judges is about a downhill spiral. Okay, and it, it actually is kind of interesting, right? You know, when you watch TV, it's like the TV shows that are interesting are the ones that have the most drama, right? Well, this is a book filled with drama, filled with craziness, uh, stories that, that don't sit well with us. Today is a story that won't sit well with us. But it's the result of what happens when God's people turn their back on him. And they experience the consequences of this, of their actions. And in this book, it gets bloody. It gets bloody. And, and I love, if you walk with us through the end of the story, through the end of the book, it's all going to make so much sense. I can't wait. Uh, there's a message, I don't know, weeks from now that just ties it all up and it makes sense of God warning his people not to engage in sin and them falling right in and and what ends up happening, okay? So hold on through the story. It's good stuff. Today is PG-13 for violence, okay? There's a little violence in here. So uh, just so you know, just warning, it's not too bad. It's like a very mild, it's like PG-13 in 1990, okay? Not like 2020 PG-13, you know what I'm saying? Okay, so PG-13 a little bit for violence. Um, But these stories of the judges are real short stories. There's some real short stories and they're, 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 they're good. They're interesting. So I encourage you, if you want on your own time, if you would, Uh, Open your Bible and read through the book of the Judges. And I hope that the sermons help you as you navigate the scriptures on your own. Last week, we looked at the first judge, Athenial. Athenial. He he comes up in Judges chapter 3, and so does this next guy, Ehud. And just a little more. Next week, we're talking about women in leadership. Okay? 
I don't know if you know what the scriptures say about women, teachers, or leaders, and stuff like that. Super controversial, so next week will be interesting. You guys will get to watch me sweat it out through that, and then you'll get to disagree with me if you want. So, or maybe you'll be like, oh yeah, that was really good, or you might be like, I don't like that guy. So, come next week, that'll be good. So, to this week, Ehud, Ehud, let me pray. Um, God, I just pray that you'd speak through your word. God, that we would be true to your word. God, there's uh, so many believers and churches and denominations that are walking away from your truth. And God, we don't have anything to stand on if we don't have your word. But God, you have given your word as a gift to us. And you promise that your words will never pass away, that we can walk away, but your word is always there. You've preserved it for thousands of years. And God, I pray that you would help us walk through life guided by your truth. And that we build our lives on your word. We thank you, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Judges chapter 3 verse 12 says this. Once again, once again, another time, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. And the Lord gave King Eglon of Moab control over Israel because of their evil. So the Moabites, this group of people, defeated the Israelites who are occupying this land that God has promised them. The Moabites defeat the Israelites and they take possession. They conquer the city of Jericho, which is the first city that the Israelites conquered going into the promised land. The one from the Sunday school stories about the walls came tumbling down, that one. The Moabites captured an occupy and they rule over the Israelites for 18 years. 18 years, the Israelites are back in captivity. Okay, they find themselves back in where they were before Moses. But, but, they finally decide to repent and turn to God. And God sends them a rescuer, a savior. And, and this book of Judges foreshadows, which most Old Testament does, the coming of Jesus, the ultimate savior. But this savior, Ehud, would rescue them out of the hands of the Moabites. Verse 15. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord raised up a rescuer to save them. See, even though they turned away from God for years, even though they walked away from God, even though they worshiped other gods, God did not walk away from them. God didn't walk away. He was always there. He was always there, willing to step in at any moment. All they had to do was say the word. And so they finally turned to God, and he came back and rescued and restored them through Ehud. His name was Ehud, son of Gera, a left-handed man of the tribe of Benjamin. The Israelites sent Ehud to deliver deliver their tribute money to King Eglon of Moab. So they're subject to the Moabites and every year they had to bring this tribute. This, I, I see it kind of almost like as a tax. They had to bring this, this, whether some sort of commodity or whatever it was, to the Moabites to declare their subjection to the Moabites for another year. So that's what they're doing. They're taking all these troops and bringing all this stuff to the Moabites to give to them. Verse 16, so Ehud, he made a double-edged dagger that was about a foot or a foot and a half long. And he strapped it to his right thigh, keeping it hidden under his clothing. He brought the tribute money to Eglon, who was very fat. Okay, I'm, I'm picturing some like sumo wrestling type dude we're talking about here. Verse 18, after delivering the payment, Ehud started home with those who had helped carry the tribute. But when Ehud reached the stone idols near Gilgah, he turned back. He came to Eglon, the king, and said, I have a secret message for you. So the king commanded his servants, be quiet. And he sent them all out of the room. Ehud walked over to the king who was sitting alone in the cool upstairs room. And Ehud said, 
I have a message from God for you. I have a message from God for you. And, and he was tricking the king. But you know what the message really is? He, he doesn't say it, but, but we kind of know what it is. Here's the message. Is don't mess with the people of God. Don't mess with the people of God. Don't step foot in their land. I have given it to them. And you guys are now to go. He doesn't tell him the message. Instead, as the king rose from his seat, verse 21, Ehud reached with his left hand. He pulled out the dagger strapped to his right thigh and plunged it into the king's belly. The dagger went so deep that the handle disappeared beneath the king's fat. So Ehud did not pull out the dagger and the king's bowels, his intestines spilled out. Then Ehud closed and locked the doors of the room and escaped down the latrine. After Ehud was gone, the king's servants returned and found the doors of the upstairs room locked. They thought that the king was using the bathroom, so they waited. But when the king didn't come after a long delay, they became concerned and they got a key. And when they opened the doors, they found their master dead on the floor. The king is dead. And while the servants were waiting, Ehud escaped, passing the stone idols on his way to Syrah. When he arrived in the hill country of Ephraim, Ehud sounded the call to arms. Then he led the band of Israelites down the hills. Follow me, he said, for the Lord has given you victory over Moab, your enemy. And so they followed him. And the Israelites took control of the shallow crossings of the Jordan River across from Moab, preventing anyone from crossing. They attacked the Moabites and killed about 10,000 of their strongest and most able-bodied warriors. Not one of them escaped. So Moab was conquered by Israel that day. And there was peace in the land for 80 years. What a wild story. What a wild story. And as I read it, I, I thought, do you think Ehud woke up one day and said, do you know what I'd love to do? I'd love to risk my life, sneak into the enemy's palace, hide a weapon, and get close enough to this morbidly obese king to push my dagger so far into his belly that I'm just elbows deep and watch his organs spill out and then run for my life. Do you think that's, he just woke up one day, said, oh yeah, here's what would be really cool. No, I don't think so. I, I highly doubt it. Actually, I bet that Ehud was scared. I bet he was scared. And I bet he thought twice about it, or maybe ten times. I bet he didn't want to do it. But sometimes God asks us to do things we would never think of or desire. It's important. Sometimes God asks us to do some things that we would never think of or desire to do. Has there ever been a time when God has asked you to do something that you didn't want to do? After I completed my undergraduate degree in business, I, I, I wanted to get into the corporate business world and climb the corporate ladder, but God had other plans and he led me to a church right out of college and I started in youth ministry and we started small, but the youth ministry began to grow over the years. And in 2011, I was about four years into the full-time gig there. And things were going extraordinarily well. The youth ministry was growing huge. We had like 30 volunteers in youth ministry, 100, almost 100 students. And we were loving it. We had great friendships that we developed we loved being at that church and we were expecting our first child, Brennan. I was completing my seminary degree and before I began seminary, our church told us that we would get a financial bump after I completed my degree. So I was getting very close to the end of grad, or getting close to graduation and I went to my supervisor and I asked him, I, I said, you know, got a baby coming and getting ready for that and 
about to finish my degree and, and you guys mentioned that I get a raise. Is, is that, are you guys planning on that still? And he said, no, that wouldn't be happening. And, and I was shocked and horrified and scared probably all at the same time. It was a huge curveball for us. Jess and I were living off of peanuts in a Cracker Jack box house. There's a lot of fish houses today, ice fish houses that are larger than our house was. Seriously, we told people, we told somebody in our small group how big our house was or how much our house cost and he's like, my driveway costs that much. And we believed him. It was probably true. It was like, oh. We would tell people our house is small and then they'd see it and be like, wow, we didn't know it was that small. But we were just living on peanuts. And the year that we had Brennan, because our health insurance was so bad, we, we put, it cost us $10,000 cash out of pocket. And so we just had nothing. We, we lived on a Dave Ramsey certified budget. Our grocery budget was barely $200 a month. And, and the math just didn't work out. We didn't, we didn't have enough money for diapers or all the extra costs, the new health care premium of having a child. We didn't have the money. And so I, I continued to go back to the church and they said, no, we're not doing anything. And it just broke my heart. It broke my heart. And, and we prayed and prayed and we talked to our wise counsel including a board member who, who loved us and deeply cared for us. And he gave us the bad news. He, he said, you know, the answer most likely is you need to go look somewhere else. And we didn't want to. We didn't want to. We loved where we were at. We loved our situation. And we wanted to stay there. But after a lot of prayer and searching, we knew that that was it. That our time there was ending in some of the most disappointing and humbling circumstances. God used this financial thing to move us on. And it was hard, especially in my line of work. We're not in it for the money. But we do need money to live off of. So with heavy hearts, we started a job search. And I harbor no bitterness or resentment towards our church or the leaders. I have much respect for them. It was just unfortunate. It was unfortunate. And so we start looking for jobs. Uh, our parents, our families all live in the city. So we start looking in the cities and start interviewing and putting resumes out. And then a, a job in Elberly comes up. And we kind of like, oh, Elberly, no. It's way too far away, too close to Iowa. That's not an Iowa joke, just so I know, because I have a New Year's resolution about no. I'm just saying. It is close to Iowa. We love Iowa, though, now. And so that came and went, and then they posted again months later, and we're like, oh, okay, well, well at least we've been to the Freeborn County Fair, so we'll throw them a resume. And we sent out a resume, and immediately I got a call from Pastor James. I was like, oh, that's great. He, he reviewed my resume and my cover letter. And he said, hey, I just had one question for you. One question for you. It's like, oh, yeah, sure. He's like, why are you leaving your church? He asked me the one question I didn't want to talk about. <laughs> like, he should have asked me about my education. Or what youth ministry is like. No. And so it was such a hard question for me to answer. I used a, de a defense mechanism to answer it. I kind of made it into a joke. And I said, well, it's all about the money. <laughs> but I began to explain our situation and he was empathetic. And he said, well, we usually don't get to this point in the, the process yet, but... Uh, what do you make and what do you need? It's like we're like 30 seconds into the conversation here. <laughs> and we knew exactly what we needed because we ran the numbers so many times. 
We knew exactly, exactly what we needed. And so we told him our answer, and, and I waited for his response. All the while thinking, hey, maybe it's us. Maybe we're ungrateful. Maybe we have too high expectations. Maybe we're wrong. But Pastor James responded something like, you know, we can do that. And a sense of relief and peace came over me. How cool. How cool. But the problem was it was in Albert Lee near Iowa. No, I'm just, I'm sorry. That wasn't in there. I know. Oh, man. I think it was on Easter. I, instead of nagging on Iowa, I I picked Nebraska. And then Susan Clement's whole family from Nebraska was watching online for Easter. I don't know what state I should pick on. Maybe Wisconsin. And so... The, the church, Crossroads, invited us to come down to Albert Lee. And we came down and, they, well, well, first they, they said, hey, we'll put you up in a hotel for, a week, for the weekend. And we were so poor, by American standards, we were so poor, that we were like, vacation! They're putting us in a hotel, this is awesome! Jess, let's do this! We're kind of newlyweds, on, you know, this is like our second honeymoon. But it wasn't a honeymoon. Brennan was three weeks old. And colicky. Really colicky. Like he wouldn't sleep at night. Like wouldn't sleep at all. Like all night. All, like, the whole night crying. And this was no different. So we checked in the hotel Friday night. Try, attempt to go to bed. The whole night. The whole night. Nothing happened. Finally, 6 a.m., I say, Jess, go to bed. 8 a.m., my interviews start. Go to bed. I take Brennan, drive around town until he falls asleep. He sleeps for a little bit. Hand him back to Jess. Go to my interviews. That was my vacation. It's like, God, what are you doing? (laughs) Why Albert Lee? And Jess was not on board initially with the idea. I wasn't too sure, but when we came down, we saw the Lord's hand everywhere. We saw the Lord's hand. That this was the place that he had chosen for us. And he'd chosen us for this place. And we jumped on board and went for the ride, and we loved it. We loved it. And we loved the the city and the town. And we even love Iowa now. We love it. See, we had a plan, but our plan was not God's. Our plan was to stay in our previous church in youth ministry. But God's plan was different. And those first four years of ministry here in youth ministry were awesome. Such a great time. And the next four years, God would call me to be a senior pastor here. I've been the lead pastor here four years now. We've been here eight years. And we just love it. We just love being here. There's no other place we could see raising our kids. And throughout my whole walk with God, God has, there's been many situations where God leads me to something different than what I would have chosen. And I wrestle with him and wrestle with him. But when I finally give in, I finally say, okay, that's when I get to see his faithfulness. That his plans are good. And that he can be trusted. And his way is so much better. What is God calling you to do? And where is he calling you to go? And when he makes that call in his still, quiet voice, will you answer it? And will you dive into the adventure? Ehud did something that he didn't want to do. But because he did, Israel was delivered from their enemies and they lived in peace for 80 years. 80 years of peace. 
we just take one right now. <laughs> 80 years of peace. Was it worth it, Ehud? Was it worth it? To go through all the mess? If we could interview Ehud today, I bet you he would say, yeah, it was nasty, it was messy, it was scary, but it was worth it. Absolutely, it was worth it. Imagine the Minnesota Twins make it to the playoffs and the World Series and they're in a tough spot. The bases are loaded and the coach makes a call to the bullpen and he says, Ehud. <laughs> he says, Jeff. He says, Bill. He says, Dave. He says, Nancy. Amber. Are you ready? Are you ready to step in the game? Because this is the time. And we could use it. Or are you going to sit this one out? Say, no. I'm content right here. I'm going to just stay right here in the bullpen. Or, as Preston challenged us just a few weeks ago, are you willing to answer the call and get in the game? I don't know what it is for you. I don't know what God's calling you to, and maybe it's nothing right now, but maybe it's something tomorrow. Will you answer the call and watch him be faithful? Let me pray. God, you can write a story that's way better than anything I can write. Even the best writers of the world. God, you can deliver from any enemy. God, you are strong and powerful. You can end any sickness or disease in a blink of an eye. And God, I pray that we would not trust in ourselves, but that we would trust in you. That we would not lean on our own understanding, but place our lives in your hands. Because there's so much safer there. And God, I love that you call imperfect people who are seriously flawed, who struggle with sin on a daily basis to join in your story. God, I pray that you'd use the people here to be world changers. Maybe what they do doesn't impact the whole world, but it impacts someone's world, God pray that you would do that and change lives because we decided to get in the game. We thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Thanks for joining us. God bless. Have a great week.